providers and doing it early. Not through the providers and credit registration deadline in early October, but doing it consistently when she was the husband of the And I think that made a huge difference for her to get out of them. But more importantly, she, she ran unashamedly of the bathroom. I am who I am. I am not going to hide. I'm not going to try to change myself. I'm not going to straighten my hair. I am who I am. And I'm here to talk about the issue. And she made the issues that were important to George and part of the They can't sort of do the other songs she was around her. So this is not to suggest that Obama was soft on race or didn't have racial kinds of conversations. But I do think his appearance do matter in how he was able to have that conversation and move through rooms. And Stacey Evans does not have that cover. Every woman does not have that cover. So in the place, she had a particular meaning for in terms of rhetoric. Right. I mean, when people see her, I think it will mean, and I hope that it will mean that we start to shift the ways that we have conversations. So one of the concerns that I have kind of as a voter, more so than as a political scientist, is kind of the, the heat of the rhetoric. Uh, and the ability to compromise. And I think that it's the case, or we know that when women show up in a legislature, the way that they govern looks a little bit different than the way that men govern. It's a little bit less zero sum than the way that, that men might govern. So I'm interested to see uh, whether that presence of women and black women in particular will change the way that uh, people do their work. I think the other thing that I hope to see- Congress Mia Love actually lost her race so they don't have any black women there. And I think it's whiter and maler at this point at least on the House side, than it ha was going in. So, I mean, w are there places for a Mia Love type person or Omarosa in one of her lives, that are, you know, before she, <laughs> you know? Well, I don't know about Omarosa. <laughs> um, um, I will say, I mean, look, I think there, there perhaps is, is some light between being a Republican and being a, tr a Trumper. Unfortunately, they say are the same party label, so it looks a lot alike, right? I mean, there's really no way to differentiate that on paper. Um, but then you do have, I mean, folks like Michael Steele, who whether you like his politics or not, there is a place, I don't know what that person would have to give up to make that place. And I don't know if the trade is worth it. I mean, ultimately we shall see. But I mean, we see people like J.C. Watts and others who decades ago said, I can't do this anymore. Not that he stopped being a Republican, but I can't work with people who won't work with me and I'm the most prominent black member you have and you can't even respect me to have a meeting. And I think that's the kind of stuff that um, makes it difficult uh, for people, not just in the Republican Party. Before we came up here on the panel, it's, it's lies, he's fearful of the subpoenas, he doesn't know what divided government is, I'm not sure if he understands how that operates in the real world of checks and balances. Um, that his rhetoric is fuels the get out the vote effort. And how do you, Dr. Grant, how do you, the sort of racial rhetoric piece of it, I think for a lot of would-be pieces still there, how do you deal with it without it kind of blowing up your campaign? Uh, I think it's going to be difficult because I, I believe that we got a preview in 2018 of Donald Trump's campaign strategy for 2020. So it's like fear and um, trying to pit Americans against each other and Americans against people who mean them no harm. I think we are going to see all of that and that it's going to be worse for 2020. I think in terms of the racial rhetoric, the response has to be kind of what it was for some of these congressional candidates this time. is to say, listen, I'm black. It's in 2020, whoever is the Democratic nominee, is Obama helpful to that candidate or not? Um, I think to the extent that he's still well liked, yes. Um, I do think it has to be more than that, though. And I think that's been the problem, I think, with Democrats. So the maps that favor Republicans this, whole, this last decade are still going to be around, that we know that these people who've been elected in these state offices are still like Latino, Latinas, what's your sense of that? And, and did 2018 kind of change anything about your thinking? I really got to kind of say. All right, I can personally <laughs> point to a place where somebody did something good for me. And so I, I think. I think 
because of her get out the vote effort, she's maximized her using on the same idea of this um, signature match. So you take these laws into effect. I bet the Republicans will pass more laws that in states that they already hold power in um, to suppress more votes. And I'm hoping that those Democrats that won at the state level will be able to counteract any. We have to make the calculation about whose decision you want to be the decision that guides uh, the policies of your life. But I, I will say that I think it makes most sense if we want to try to combat that, to have conversations with voters in their homes, at their doorsteps about, hey, this is who I am. This is how my being elected will shape your life. Please register to vote. And then we have to show up again and say, hey, it's time to turn out to vote. Please turn out to vote now. And Dr. Dr. Carter, you know about the Maryland race there between Ben Jealous and, and Larry Hogan. Is that something that he did with his campaign, show up, show up often to talk to voters? He, of course, lost by about, I think, what, 15 points or so in Maryland. Ben Jealous? Ben Jealous, right. Um, you know, I cannot say what Ben Jealous did. Mm -hmm. and, 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 I, and this is not to be facetious, but Ben Jealous didn't really run that kind of campaign. I have Stacey Abrams election material mm -hmm. in DC, <laughs> right? I have no Ben Jealous material. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't know if that was just a function of, of, of money and whatever, but um, to Dr. Middlemass's point, it doesn't take a lot of money to tell people who you are. And I think, I don't know where he ran. I'm sure he ran somewhere. I mean, he got over 900,000 votes. Somebody showed up to vote for him. And I do think his name recognition did help in that regard. I mean, he was head of the NAACP. So, I mean, he has some name recognition and some visibility. But I didn't see him campaign. I didn't see any electoral material. I mean, we're right here at the border of PG County and Montgomery counties, and I saw nothing. I heard no, no radio advertisements, nothing about Ben Jealous. But Hogan, to a certain extent, because he's an incumbent, didn't need to run, right? I mean, he had a record. He could point to what he's done. I mean, Ben Jealous is, is, is really an unknown quantity electorally. I mean, we know he's, he has this activist side, but we don't actually know what he does as an office holder. Um, Hogan can say, I've built this legislative record. I am a moderate Republican. I don't do this, this, this crazy Trump business, right? I'm going to let uh, PG County be a sanctuary county, right? And I'm going to leave them alone. Um, and I think uh, Jealous just did not show up. And where in the venues where he did, I think he did something on CNN with Van Jones and Dave Chappelle who, was a, who endorsed him early. I don't know that that resonates with Maryland voters. It may mean something nationally to making people see you, but I don't know that it did anything for Maryland voters. I mean, clearly he lost uh, by not a small amount. So um, Hogan won the day, but I don't think that was just because people love Larry Hogan um, so much as I don't know that Ben Jealous gave them anything to hold on to. Yeah. And I don't even know what a slogan was. Right. And one of the takeaways from, from 2018 was if you look at the people who ran in states like Florida, in Georgia, in Texas, O'Rourke, Gillum, and, and Abrams, they were progressive, they were black, and in, ca in, in Beto's case, he was not Latino, but some people may have thought he was. Um, um, and one of the things was that that side of the Democratic Party lost, right? And the side that won were people like Gretchen Whitmer, right, who won in Michigan. People like Kirsten Sinema, uh, who won out in Arizona, who were more moderate uh, Democrats. And I wonder what you make of that argument, that Sort of brown and black progressives lost in the Sun Belt, but, but the, the white candidates who were more middle of the road actually won, and, and maybe in 2020 you do need to run somebody like Biden if you're a Democrat. What's your sense of that? I'm not ready to let go of the um, kind of hard leaning, left leaning progressive approach yet. If it was the case that Andrew Gillum or Stacey Abrams or Beto O'Rourke won by like large majorities, and I'd be like, all right, fine, it didn't work. Um, it did not work in the sense that these people might not end up in the state house, but it, like getting four million people to vote for you in Florida is a big deal uh, to me. And I think that the the kind of problem in a place like Florida, in a place like Georgia, is that the electorate is still changing, the demographics are evolving, but they have not yet evolved to a place where these kind of candidates can win. I think we're very close to it, but I think there's still work to do. And so I think for the person running in 2020, they have to balance kind of this idea that it's going to be a moderate, a white moderate who runs from the center because most of America looks like most of Florida, uh, and we have these very dense 
uh, population centers of people who are very diverse, but most of America is kind of not like that. So we have to speak to that, but we can't toss to the side this idea that progressives are running a campaign that excites people, that gives them something to vote for rather than something to vote against. And uh, Dr. Carter, if you're advising Kamala Harris, Cory Booker, Deval Patrick, what are you telling them about the state of the nation now and their chances in 2020 and, and how they should run? Well, um, this is certainly not my bailiwick. Um, but I will say this. I mean, I think the, all those people you named are very much, I would say, of the sort of like Obama ilk. Mm -hmm. And so to a certain extent, I don't know that their road would be any easier, but they certainly have a brand, I think, that some of these newer candidates did not yet have. They have it now, mm -hmm. but they certainly have had it longer. And I think that Kamala Harris running as a senator, Cory Booker running as a senator, I mean, I, I, they have shown that they can win with white voters. They had to, right? There's no way you're going to win a New Jersey or a California or a Massachusetts right. without a strong coalition of white voters, uh, black voters, Latino voters, and everybody else in between. So they have shown that they can win at the state level. But I will say this. I mean, I think it's hard to run a national campaign because it's not a one-size-fits-all nation, right? Uh, Texas, Florida, I mean, those places are, are, if they're not already majority minority, will be there very shortly, California is. And they clearly have a desire and a need for a certain kind of politics. And as Dr. Grant already pointed out, they're not there yet, but they will be there shortly. But what are they doing in the meantime? They're building that get out the vote apparatus. They're building that, that ground game that a, a Kamala Harris or a Deval Patrick or a Cory Booker would need to win in a Texas, in a Florida, because Deep South matters. Right? Those places have lots of electoral votes and they have lots of people and lots of resources. So they need those places. So I would tell them, I mean, it doesn't feel good, right? But you are going to have to read the room. What plays in New York and what plays in Maryland is not going to play in North Carolina or Idaho or South Dakota or California or Washington State. So you're going to have to run a 50 state campaign, but I will also tell them, don't give up on the South, yeah. right? The South is actually in play. I think if nothing else, we know that that whole kind of democratic rhetoric that the South, that you can't win the South, isn't necessarily the case anymore. You can, yeah. and it, had, it can be done. <laughs> and so I think it, it puts, it, it will put a lot more, it will, I would say put a lot more responsibility, make the Democratic Party do its job, because it didn't do its job for all those Democratic candidates. Dr. Mordelais? And we are, regardless of the outcome of the is at the state level, at the local level, um, are really important, maybe even more important to your day-to-day -day life. So if you were thinking about uh, American voters, post-Trump. And again, because I, I, I feel like it's already been written off <laughs> at this point by you all with Trump in terms of African American voters. He'll get the sort of requisite 10% of African American voters. But beyond Trump, what do you see that relationship being? I think that the Republican Party has work to do. And so if it's the case that Donald Trump is going to leave office whenever he leaves office, I don't think it'll be enough for him to leave office and black people to be like, all right, I'm interested in thinking about the Republican Party again. I think it will have to be the case that candidates and party leaders say things out loud and directly to black people about like, listen, I know that thing was crazy and I'm sorry. I am not that kind of person. This is actually what I believe. And I don't know that they're gonna do that. Um, and so because they are not gonna come and say, listen, I'm sorry. Donald Trump was crazy. I only did this because I needed to get elected. I didn't mean it. Well, and I, yeah, I, I just I feel like the Republicans have ceded so much of that ethical ground um, to races and white nationalists in the name of power seeking. I don't know that you can dial that back because you can't dial back this hate. That doesn't just go in a jar because this person is out of office. This anti-Semitism, this misogyny, I mean, it's always been there, right? This anti-blackness, that's always been there. But you, I, I feel like in the moment that we're in right now, there is a, just a veneer of nastiness. And while white supremacy is always, all the time, everywhere, because this is the United States, I think there's a speaking to it and a calling on it that is not just 
uh, double speak or just this kind of, I want to win, let me say this stuff that I know will make people vote for me. I think it's an actual belief. And to the extent that other Republicans who of good conscience, if there are any, don't say anything, then they believe it too. And I don't know that any, I don't want to say right thinking black person, but I don't mean it right thinking like correct, but I am a right thinking person, I'm a conservative person. I don't know how you square that with your blackness, even if you believe some of the same things, but I don't know that we can believe the same things if you hate me. Because that's the end of a relationship, not right. the beginning of one. So I don't know that this is going to happen. As Dr. Grant said, it could. Maybe there is some revolution happening inside the Republican Party that we are not aware of yet, and that there is going to be. And it has to come from a white man. Yep, yep. It can't come from anybody else. I don't know that that is going to happen. Because they have not <coughs> shown any shame for anything. Uh, whether it's, you know, talk about monkeying this up, right? That's not a slip of the tongue in my mind, right? Um, talk about this caravan of people as this dangerous horde when you're talking about refugees, asylum seekers, right? I don't know that you can then go back and tell me, but I believe in God and country and all these other good things. And oh, and by the way, I just said that person is a, I didn't really mean it because you're the good kind. I don't know that you can do that anymore. I, and the candidate, I've forgotten her name, in Mississippi, Tim running Mike against Smith. Mike Smith. Espy, yeah. yes, yeah. talking about public hangings and I'd be in the front row. Like, you can't take that back, because it doesn't mean anything except what it means. You're not, we're not getting, word, we're not going to wordsmith that into, oh, I meant, like, no, I just wanted to go have a picnic with black people. No, I didn't. I think the, the other thing that we should be thinking about too is that many people understand politics as a thing that happens in increments. And so if it is the case that Ron DeSantis uh, has some idea that black people are in or are related to monkeys and he's the governor of Florida, you better believe he got his eyes set on the White House. He's not the only one, right? So there are a bunch of people who are talking this kind of Republican Trump talk who are members of Congress, maybe they're mayors, maybe they're governors, and they have their eyes set on the White House. And since Donald Trump is able to be the president of the United States and kind of hold these extreme positions, they believe that they can do it too. So I don't have any expectation that his leaving office is going to take with it uh, all of this hate that he brought out. So is Gillum going to run again in Florida? I don't know. Um, this is a short answer. The longer answer is that I uh, would encourage everybody who was thinking about him to think about what it must be like to, to do the hardest thing you could ever do or have ever done in your life for almost two years, um, to have it not go the way that you planned for it to go. Uh, to make your peace with it and make a speech about it and they have to get back on stage and to win. Um, I don't know, I mean, hopefully if, if he runs again, maybe not for something as, as lofty as governor, maybe he starts in the state house. And I think that helps to engender some sort of good feelings. And Maryland is, is a kind of conservative <laughs> in that way. Like they like people to have done some time mm -hmm. before they do mm -hmm. other things. And I think, um, I think he's going to, to perhaps do that, and I think that will help clear the path if he has these higher aspirations. Because I do think um, his his name recognition did help, and uh, it clearly got him a lot of the way. Um, he did better, I think, than, than he certainly did better than I anticipated. Um, and it wasn't just you know a total shellacking, but um, civic engagement as one of their core values. But this was my first time ever seeing them say, "Listen, this." who we are across the nation, govern yourself accordingly. Anybody else? Uh, I can't say who people's staff were, but I do know that um, Abrams and other campaigns were engaging black women who, who were doing research around black women who were interested in them and wanting to know, like, hey, are we doing the right thing? Right. So I do think um, there was at least a willingness um, on the part of that campaign to engage um, and wanting to figure out how to do this better. Right. right? So he, he, men, you got to step up. But black and white young women who are working on campaigns and door knocking and making fun talking. about the election in light of 
how many African American women got against Bush in 2020. And, and I'd love to get your take on that. And secondly, I want your take on run. You get ready, it's about to be 12 people running. Um, I had this conversation this weekend and settled on Chris Murphy, who is the junior senator that the Democrats did. a good job. Dr. Middlelast? I no, have no clue for 2020. I don't believe any of you guys when you say that, but that's fine. <laughs> no, I really, I really don't know who could win a nomination. Okay. I, I think there will be 12, 15, 18. I don't even think we have a complete list, even if we came up with a list. I think there's people out there that are going to run that we haven't even put on our go-to list. And the advisability of a white person versus a black person or a brown person, what's your take on that? Beto O'Rourke might be the best go-between. Because he's like faux Latino. Not, right, he's faux Latino. Faux Latino. I mean, he, he is, but he's, I, I he's a white man that, right. is, that represented a Latino district yeah. in the House of with Representatives yeah. with a Latino name. And some people think he's Latino. And a lot of people think yeah. he's Latino. <laughs> right. And cash is not a problem. He's married to a wealthy woman and she's got money. And Because we got to think about these things. It's, it's who has access to money. Like, let's, we can't diverge from that. I'm not saying that a poor person can't run for president, but it's it helps when you don't have to have a regular day job if you're running for president. Um, in terms of the blue wave, I think the blue wave, yes, took place. It took place because now the Democrats will control the House of Representatives. But you have to look for the blue wave at the state level. You have to think about all those state houses that flipped. The Democrats that are now in state legislature legislators, um, now there are state legislators, that are now on city council, that are now energized. I think that is where you'll see the blue wave. The Republicans won the U.S. Senate seats they were supposed to win. So it's not like they were special. Like They should have actually picked up five or six seats, and the fact they didn't shows you their problems. But Republicans won the Senate seats they were supposed to, but they lost a lot of seats they should have held on to. And so the blue wave was in those areas, suburbs, and at the state okay. level. Okay. I think. Yes, ma'am. Hi, everyone. My name is Mayla Hill. I'm a sophomore international business major from Chicago. And um, I wanted to just kind of shift the topic of, like, Republicans and Democrats wanting to know if, like, they, I don't know. At the state level. Um, proportional voting is one way that we could address some of these democratic gaps, right? Instead of, you know, winner take all, we could, you know, apportion seats differently. I mean, there are other, always other ways we can do democracy, right? Um, but to your point about is there a way that you can serve your communities, though, and things you can do? Absolutely. Most cities have open positions for commissioners. That's something that you don't need to be in a party for. You don't have to run an election for, um, like, you know, here in the city, there are all kinds of commissions that you can sit on. Um, there are um, um, ANCs, which are um, advisory neighborhood councils. I'm sure they have something similar in Chicago. I don't know what they would call them there. But these are usually, I mean, you're talking about people winning elections with like 500 votes. These are not, these are very small, discrete neighborhood races that you can run and you can be unaffiliated, and you could probably win it just by virtue of the fact that you're the person who put their name in the race. Because in my neighborhood, for example, there was one person. There was nobody else, right? So they win by default. So I'm not suggesting that you should go to the path of least resistance. However, this is an extremely important position in a community, in a neighborhood to have. And I would say, look at your neighborhood. If you want to do public service, there are lots of volunteer opportunities to do that that don't require you to be on city council, that don't require you to say declare a party if you want to remain unaffiliated. There are lots of ways in which you can be uh, impactful and important. And, and I would also say if there are organizations that are doing the kind of work that you want to do, organize with them, work with them, volunteer with them, um, see how as a student you might have skills that they need. 
right? How can you be of service to these organizations so you can start doing that? And and I think there's a you know to Dr. Grant's point a way to 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 get out of the cynicism is to look at the vibrancy in your own neighborhoods because I think sometimes we we get so focused at the national level we don't even look at what's happening in our own communities and there are lots of, of things to organize about and around in your communities if you um, are passionate about that if you want to do that. So the Kanye West piece. I <laughs> Um, so I think I saw this video where they like singing uh, Kendrick Lamar, which is crazy because that's we're gonna be all right as a protest song. Um, but I will guess that that's like all of them that they all talked, and that's pretty much everybody who has that position in the room together. Um, so I I would just I think encourage students to use social media as a tool to to make sure that you use it to collect information to understand the world but like to take to dr carter's point to be in the world and so when she's saying that somebody won an election with 500 votes she doesn't mean buy 500 votes she means like 500 people voted so your i don't know a fraction of your freshman class could help you be the anc commissioner that represents howard university um and that's not partisan and, and they're not talking about things that have to be divisive. They're talking about things like, uh, where are we going to put a dog park? Maybe we clearly need one by Howard so these people can stop. Um, <laughs> that's a different panel. <laughs> there's always ways to get, and this is just echoes my colleague's comments, there's always ways to be involved in your community without politics. So think about if you care about domestic violence, you can volunteer at domestic violence outreach centers. You can do, there's, there's now outreach right now, because we have to remember the, the inequality in DC. And families right now at this time of the year are deciding if they pay their rent or buy food or you know, put gas in the, the tank to get to their job. Do a fundraiser on your floor. Everybody gather a can. Like there's so many things we can do to help the people that are immediately in our um, communities that I think that is a much better way than dealing with the partisan rhetoric and the, the stuff that gets thrown out in terms of politics. Great question. I think we're going to stay in line. Thank you. <clears throat> Uh, I have a six to nine class tonight after this. And no, I want to take this into my class. It's a painting class where coincidentally they're painting portraits of the black women that they admire. Um, and so I want to take a message to them in that process. Now, I want to compliment you also because when I was a student, the age of many of these students uh, went down to Duke University and heard Frank Mahima speak and then we saw a concert of Aretha Franklin wow. and so that energized us and made us understand who was really organizing the civil rights movement and the black power movement and the black consciousness movement. Uh, Meanwhile, I was put up in front but, you know, the organizing was about black men. I mean, it's just a matter of fact. That was 50 years ago. And so I'm wondering, I have this research that I'm doing, which happens to be my life. I haven't read a lot of books on it, but I just live. And I'm thinking that we're on a 50-year cycle. Now, I'm referencing 1968, when the buildings were taken over here at Howard University, uh, I can admit that I was one of the students. I'm proud of it. Uh, they tried to put me out of, you know, uh, this is not about me. I'm trying to say to you that I be on the precipice of a student movement 50 years from, I mean, this is 1968, uh, sorry, 20, 18, which is 50 years from 1968. So are we on the precipice of a normal student movement with the spirit of Sue Mahima in New York? Is what I'm feeling. Because she delivered very specific, and she was you know, organized in the Freedom Democratic Party. And uh, I'm charging you with her spirit. I'm 
what part did you do? Political science double major from the gorgeous nice. Prince George's County in Maryland. And, <laughs> and um, I, this past election, I like had to travel home to vote and all that. And one question on the ballot that really um, took my attention was asking whether so, um, someone who hasn't been registered for a year is able to get involved in um, politics or run for a position. And me and my dad had a conversation about it and to me it was like another form of suppression of political involvement and I wanted to know if you thought the next thing is since voter suppression is um, an issue being tackled um, greatly whether it be actual involvement in the political community would be another um, suppression issue. Who wants to take this? Uh, I think the short answer is yes and I think that I have had conversations with students who who have evidence that they are particularly suppressed. So people asked for ballots and didn't get them. Uh, people showed up at home and weren't on their voter rolls because they haven't been home in two years or these other kinds of things. So I think that it is possible that voter suppression might occur at the ballot box. I think by virtue of the fact that you are young and you are a woman, um, that people are gonna try to intimidate you when you show up in political spaces. But since you have a degree from po political science and chemistry at Howard University, I expect that you will push back when they try to intimidate you and show them what you know um, and not cower from these spaces where they don't want you to be because you have a right to be there. Next question. Thank you. Hi, my name is Ryan. I'm a sophomore political science major, strategic legal and management communications minor from Nashville. I was wondering why do you think it is that black women in particular have such an extraordinary ability to mobilize people? Do you think it's because we sort of are forced to with our identities both as a black person and as a woman or what's your take on that? Doctor, who wants to take it? Dr. Uh, you well, I'll start. Go ahead. You can. When haven't we organized? So we just do what we do and we just continue to do it and um, some of us find joy in that organizing, some of us find joy in the building of friendships and the networks and the girlfriend support and the sister circles that it just becomes who we are. I, but I don't want it to, to sound innate either, mm. right? Like, because then that becomes a little dicey for me, <laughs> right? Because there has to be some accountability on that other end, because if black women are doing all this work, and it's labor, right? Then what are black men doing? And this is not to say black men aren't doing anything. They certainly are doing lots of stuff. But I, I think that, that, that trope of this is what just black women do, as if somebody just wants to push that ball up the hill all the time. I mean, you do what you have to do, but like, I think there's an idea that it, it is not weary inducing, <laughs> right? That it does not make people tired, does it not make people frustrated. Like, yeah, I mean, I think there are definitely people who find joy in it. There are also people who find frustration and heartache on the other end of that too. I think we romanticize it um, and, and, and we don't tend to the many ways in which black women are hurt and harmed in that work. I mean, we talk about people like Fannie Lou Hamer, but I mean, these women weren't just organizing, they were organizing, having life threatened, having themselves be shot at, dying prematurely. Like these things happen to black women. Black women fall apart too. So I do think it's a lot of what we do, but that is not necessarily innate to us. I think that's a social byproduct. And I think we do need to address that because I think when black women fall short of that ideal, that in, hey, people, what are they doing? You know, what's wrong with that black woman? She ain't pushing that ball up the hill. She don't want to be Alice today. What's wrong yeah. with her? Um, and, and I do think that that is, it is heroic and it is something that um, we valorize, but I also don't think we take enough time sometimes to think about the toll that does take on some black women who do do that work. Uh, and not just in political campaigns, at churches, at mm -hmm. schools, at you know their workplaces, um, they in their families, right? I mean, everybody got a, a lot of us know a big mama or somebody <laughs> who is making it happen for multiple generations of people, and that means that we see a lot of black women die young yeah. from lots of kinds of things. Great. Next question, and we want to try to get through as many as possible. Okay. Hi, y'all. Yeah. Um, my name is Ashley, and I am a PhD student here at Howard. 
And I wanted to get your take on. Oh, just kind of talk. Um, I wanted to get your take on the exit poll dating for Black women in Florida. Mm, yeah. Well, yeah. You, you didn't get a finish. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. I don't trust it. Yeah, basically, 18, the exit poll shows that 18% of black women in Florida voted for the Republican Ron DeSantis over Andrew Gillum. Yeah, the short answer is I don't trust it. Okay. Uh, the longer answer, since you are a graduate student, is that I need to see the intuition in the model. Who is this person? Mm -hmm. Or who are these people? Where do they live? Did they know it was a poster? Were they trying to... The Democrats will coalesce around somebody. They inevitably will. Don't you utilize me? who's running in 2020. Um, yeah. Well, I would say, I mean, do it anymore and not use media. I, I think that's one of the lessons we learned in this election from the people who didn't have money, um, mm -hmm. that radio and TV do, don't work and you don't necessarily need them. Yeah. Yeah. Next question. Hello, I am Kayla Rick, a sophomore of political science and economics study major from Chicago. Hi, Professor Carter. Hi, Kayla. That's my teacher. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so my question is, as someone who's like really politically involved on campus and off campus, I still had trouble when I received um, What did you want to see more for him, from him in particular? Because I feel as though, you know, Andrew Gillum, um, you know, O'Rourke yeah, Aur um, got his time to shine, Stacey Abrams got her time. What did you want to see more from Ben Jealous in particular? And I didn't see him anywhere. And that's what I meant more than, you know, um, whether I thought he was a trustworthy person or not. I mean, he's a politician. But I want... Second, if you haven't already done so, please join the Walter Center mailing list. You can visit our website at waltercenter.howard.edu. Click contact and then fill out the form. All you need is your name, your email address, and type mailing list in the message, bo message box. We're also on Facebook at Walter Center. And then, as always, there are a lot of people who have put these things together. Please give it up for Ms. Carolyn Smith. Please raise your hand. Uh, after call, some of the, some of the uh, comments that were made earlier is a black woman who actually is the engine that makes this thing run. <laughs> And I'm standing here running right my mouth, taking credit for it all. Thank you. So thank you. Also, Mr. L. Watkins, who works here in the library, he's not in the room right now, but he helped facilitate a lot of this, and I want to thank him publicly. And lastly, a big shout out to WHUT, who has helped us with the live stream. And, and all of that. Thank you all very much. Uh, if you have some more questions, you can ask it to the three remaining panelists, but I'm going to ask for me and Malika Anderson out of here. And so thank you all very much for coming.